is noted in the church bulletin, the scripture this morning is from Galatians chapter 1, <laughs> verses 6 through 9. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we are an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let him be eternally condemned. As we have already said, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let him be eternally condemned. Good morning. We're so thankful to have our visitors, Bob and Karen Brown. We appreciate you coming our way from Bakersfield. And Gary, what's your sweet wife's name? Lynette. Gary and Lynette Beerley uh, from Quincy. And they're good friends of Bruce and Katie. And as a matter of fact, um, Gary and Bruce share the pulpit up there at Quincy. And did you know anything about Grover Beach uh, before you came here, or did he tell you anything? It's just a coincidence that you're here? Oh, my, my daughter lives here. Oh, I see. Well, anyway, uh, he just learned that uh, uh, I baptized Bruce and also married them. And um, they're great friends of ours, and it's so um, nice to, to meet you two because... We've heard some great things about you. Uh, Bruce and Katie have told us how important you are to that work up there. And, uh, it, you know, he told me that you shared the pulpit. And uh, today I got a chance to meet you both. And I think that's wonderful. I'm glad you came by to be a part of us. Bow with me in prayer, please. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this beautiful day. And we are twice blessed in that we not only have this beautiful weather and beautiful place to live, but we also are blessed with another Lord's Day. That we can come together upon the first day of the week to break bread in the Lord's Supper and to fellowship one another in worship and praise to you and remember the Lord's death and hear a message from your holy book, the Bible. We're so thankful you hear our prayers, our petitions, our intercessions, our requests. And we pray to your Lord for those that are suffering with chronic illnesses and problems in the church family and among those loved ones and friends of church members. We pray for those that are traveling, and we pray for their safety, and we pray for their return. Father, we know that there are many false prophets that have gone out into the world, and we know that it is our place to be fruit inspectors, to determine the good fruit from the bad fruit, so that we know whether or not the tree is good, and that there are many false prophets, and that we are to discern the spirits, whether they are from God. And Father, we know that a horrible curse is pronounced upon those that would present a different gospel 
than the one that we have preached by the Apostle Paul and the other apostles. And help us to discern the true from the false. Help us to love the truth and loathe error in whatever form we find it. And help us to be better prepared that we may be better fruit inspectors with regard to truth as opposed to error. In Jesus' name, amen. I would, say, I would say that if you would remove all the verses in the New Testament that are written to address uh, false teaching and false practices unapproved by God, if you were to remove all that from the New Testament, you wouldn't even have a third left. Every epistle of the New Testament was written to address specific errors and problems in all those different churches. It is very important that we understand that we can't just simply preach on all the positive and think that the negative will take care of itself. The New Testament wasn't written like that. Jesus didn't teach like that. Paul didn't teach like that. Oh, yes, there's every reason to be positive and hopeful and to give hope and encouragement uh, to the church family. But it's also an imperative to preach the whole gospel and not just a part of it. And therefore, it behooves us to also warn of the dangers of false prophets. The last time, uh, two weeks ago, I spoke from this pulpit, we addressed Islam, the religion of Muhammad. And I mentioned that when I got back here, I would address the subject of the Quran, which is the Bible of Islam. And why would I do this? It is because of the rapid increase in growth and the spreading of this religion throughout the world. Billions and billions of people are turning to Islam Embracing, embracing the Koran as the word of God. And uh, there is the possibility that what happened to Europe may happen to America. Uh, since each generation shows that the Islam families are growing faster and larger than um, non-Islam uh, people. Now, Islam is the religion of almost a billion people in the world today. And as I mentioned, the Koran is a book claimed to have been transmitted uh, through a chain starting from God himself to Gabriel, the angel, to Muhammad, and then to his people. I have a copy here, my copy of the Koran, and I have read every page of this book. And um, several years ago, and in the last couple weeks, Linda has watched me read this thing uh, off and on for, uh, for a couple weeks, and just reviewing a lot of the things that I had read, and uh, to make sure that I truly represented what it says in that book. And so we are today going to ask the question, is the Koran from God or man? Let me just simply state uh, a clear fact. Muhammad was born in the 6th century, and he died in the 7th century. And so we're talking about six centuries after the New Testament was written, and many more centuries after the Old Testament was written. Now we know that the New Testament reflects the teachings of the first century because all the church writers of the second and third century, if we didn't have the word of God, scholars say we could duplicate the New Testament from all the writings of the church 
fathers of the 2nd, 3rd, and the 4th century. And comparing their writings with what we have in the New Testament, it's practically identical. And the same goes with the Old Testament. We know that the Old Testament existed fully and completely before the birth of Christ because we have copies of the Greek translation of the Old Testament around 200 B.C. called the Septuagint because it's claimed to have been translated by 70 Jewish scholars. And so what we have here is proof that the New Testament ex- and the Old Testament existed in a period of time in close proximity to Jesus Christ. And so therefore, it did not have the time to be corrupted. Now, when Muhammad claimed that God revealed these things to him, he also claims that he is one of a line of prophets going all the way back to Adam. He accepts the Old Testament as a divine revelation. He says the angel Gabriel told him that the Old Testament was revealed to the various people like Moses and David and Solomon and the prophets and so forth, and that they were the word of God for those people. Let me just read to you what I have quoted out of this book concerning its claim for the Old Testament. Now, it will become clear to you why I'm sharing this with you in a few moments. Now, their chapters are called surah, but I'm just going to use chapters to make it a little simpler. In chapter 19 of this um, Quran, it says, And commemorate Moses in the book, for he was a man of purity and an apostle and prophet. Chapter 2, Gabriel said, To Moses we gave the book. And chapter 6, Who sent down the book which Moses brought a light and guidance to man, which ye set down on paper. Say, it is God. Chapter 6, chapter 12, of old we gave Moses the book. Now this is supposedly Gabriel and the angels communicating to Muhammad concerning what they did in the days of the Old Testament writers. In chapter 17, higher gifts have we given to some of the prophets than to others, and the Psalter, which is the book of Psalms, we gave to David. In chapter 23, and we gave Moses the book for Israel's guidance. Chapter 29, thus have we sent down the book of the Koran to thee, to Muhammad, and they to whom we have given the book of the law believe in it. In other words, the Jews should believe in the Koran. And they gave the book to Moses. And then in chapter 40, of old gave we Moses the guidance, and we made the children of Israel the inheritors of the book, that is, the Old Testament, a guidance and warning to men endued with understanding. And then in chapter 46, but before the Koran was the book of Moses, a rule and a mercy, and this book confirmeth it. In other words, the Quran confirms the writings of Moses in the Arabic tongue, that those who are guilty of that wrong may be warned and as glad tidings to the doers of good. Chapter 57. And of old sent we Noah and Abraham, and on their seed conferred the gift of prophecy and the book. And then in chapter 4. Verily we have revealed to thee as we revealed to Noah and the prophets after him and as we revealed to Abraham and Ishmael and Isaac and Jacob and the tribes and Jesus and Job and Jonah and Aaron and Solomon and to David gave we psalms. So what is the conclusion? This book, the Koran, claims that the Old Testament was inspired by God. 
All right? Muhammad claims that the same God that revealed the Old Testament to the people of the Jews was the same God who revealed the Koran to him. He does not discredit but uphold the teachings of the Old Testament. And he claims that all those writers were prophets sent from God. All right, so that's an important principle. Because if the Koran contradicts the Old Testament or the New Testament, then we know that the Koran has misrepresented the Old Testament and the New Testament, and there's a contradiction. But let me share with you the uh, claim of the or the challenge of the Koran. Let's look at a standard of judgment. The principle of contradiction, because there are contradictions here. Truth is non-contradictory. Otherwise, it is not true. For example, something cannot exist and not exist. That's a contradiction. If something exists, it cannot be non-existent. God is the standard of truth, and therefore, he cannot lie. Twice in Scripture, Titus 1 and verse 2, Hebrews 6 and 8, it says, God cannot lie. God is a God of truth. Jesus is the truth revealer. He is the truth. John 14 and verse 6. Now, in John 17, 17, Jesus says, Sanctify the people in truth. Your word is truth. Truth is non-contradictory. But notice the challenge of the Koran. And I'm looking at chapter 4. Can they not consider the Koran word from any other than God? They would surely have found in it many contradictions. Chapter 6. But is any more wicked than he who deviseth a lie of God, or saith, I have had a revelation when nothing was revealed to him? Chapter 6 further, who then is more wicked than he who in his ignorance invented a lie against God to mislead people? If the Old Testament is from God, and since it originated centuries before the Koran and Muhammad, then the Koran must harmonize with its teachings or it is a lie. There can be no contradictions between the revelation here and the so-called revelation here. All right. Let's just check. In chapter 2, we read that Muhammad confuses the story of Saul and his troops facing Goliath and the Philistines that with that of Gideon, Route of the Midianites. He says that Saul selected his troops by having them drink from a brook. And Judges 7, it was Gideon who selected his troops at the brook. Judges 7, 1 through 7. Nowhere do we read of Saul selecting his troops by the way they drank the water from the stream, as Gideon did. Well... Going on in chapter 11, according to the Koran, Noah had a son who perished in the flood. Are my eyes wide open? Whoa. Let me read. We said, carry into it one pair of every kind and family, except him on whom sentence hath been passed and those who have believed. And the ark moved on with them amid the waves like mountains. And Noah called to his son, for he was apart. Embark with us, O my child, and be not with the unbelievers. He said, I will betake me to a mountain that shall secure me from the water. He said, none shall be secure this day from the decrees of God, save him on whom he has shown mercy. And a wave passed between them. And he was among those that drowned. The Bible 
Genesis 6 and 10 says, Noah became the father of three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Chapter 7, verse 1, Then the Lord said to Noah, Enter the ark, you and all your household. For you alone I have seen to be righteous before me at this time. Chapter 7, Then Noah and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him entered the ark because of the water of the flood. Genesis 8, 18, after the flood, Noah went out and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him. 1 Peter 3 and verse 20, it says that all, that eight souls were saved from the flood. Noah, his wife, his three sons, and their wives. That makes eight. Genesis says all were saved. The Quran says one was lost. There's a contradiction. And if they both claim to be the truth, and the Quran was written after the Bible, and it contradicts the Bible, are you going to say that the Quran is true and the Bible is wrong? When he already said the Bible was true? Well, let's go on. In the story of Joseph, When he fled from his master's house, away from the man's wife, who wanted to force herself upon him, it says they examined the coat that he left behind. As you recall, he fled the house and he left his uh, overcoat. It says they examined the coat left to determine if it was ripped from the back or front and determined that the woman was lying in chapter 12. She confesses that she lied, but Joseph was thrown in prison for not obeying her. In Genesis 39, it is clear that the woman lied to her husband about Joseph, and Joseph was taken and thrown in prison because of the accusation of the man's wife. Contradiction that is very glaring. Now, there are several contradictions in the story of Joseph repeated in the Quran. But one that is interesting is that Muhammad confuses the story of Isaac with that of Joseph. As you may recall, Isaac was almost blind and gave Jacob the opportunity to pretend that uh, to be Esau and trick his father into giving him, his elder brother's inheritance in Genesis 27. As you may recall, Isaac smelled Jacob to see if it was really Esau, and since he was an outdoorsman and hunter. And he was convinced because of the trickery of Jacob. But in the Quran, Joseph sends his garment to his father Jacob, who is now blind uh, to recover his sight. Jacob recognizes his scent from the garment as his son's. He's obviously comparing two stories here uh, and contradicts the biblical account. It says also in chapter 28 that Moses fled from Pharaoh and when he finally reached a well in the desert, he met seven sisters, Exodus 2 But in the Quran, it says he only met two sisters. Next, in the story of Moses, when the people in the wilderness complain, the Quran says that God threatens to send the people back to Egypt. And Moses said vileness and poverty were stamped upon them, and they returned with the wrath of God. This, for that they disbelieved the signs of God and slew the prophets unjustly. In chapter 2. What's so amazing is that we have such a glaring uh, anachronism. You know what an anachronism is. It's, it's confusing the times and the events uh, and, and putting them in different chronological order. So here he says they were guilty of killing the prophets. The Jews didn't kill any of the prophets until hundreds of years later. And yet... Muhammad is saying that the killing of the prophets were taking place already. 
He was grossly ignorant of the Old Testament chronology. Uh, The speaker could not be an angel of God since he would have known the facts. According to the Koran in chapter 7, Moses performed nine plagues in Egypt, and one of them was a flood. Are my eyes wide open? Those children in there, I think only one today, right, knows that there were ten plagues in Egypt, right? And if memory serves me correctly, I don't think there was a flood among the ten. Here is a list of what they are. The water of the Nile turned into blood. There were frogs, lice, flies, pestilence on the livestock, boils on man and beast, heavy hail, swarm of locusts, and three days of darkness, and death of the Egyptian firstborn. Did you hear flood? Did you hear ten? Obviously, there's a contradiction here. Next, we find in the Koran, <clears throat> when Joseph brought his family down to Egypt, it says that his parents were brought into him, and he lifted up his parents to the seat of state. That's in chapter 12. Now, his full brother, Benjamin, was a full-grown man at that time. And Benjamin and Joseph's mother died in childbirth when Benjamin was born. And yet the Koran said that Joseph brought his parents down to Egypt and exalted his parents, mother and father. He had no mother. She had been dead for probably 25 years. Next, that's in Genesis 35, 19, if you would like to double-check that. When John the Baptist was born, the Koran claims in chapter 19 that the name John had never been used before. Now, you know what I'm going to tell you. There were seven prominent figures in the Old Testament bearing the Hebrew name John. And it occurs 24 times in the New Testament. But the Koran said once John the Baptist was born and given the name John, it had never, ever been used before. You want to take the Bible or you want the Koran? As being the truth. One of the most glaring. Contradictions. Is the birth of Jesus. Muhammad says. That Mary. And this is in. Chapter 19 of the Quran. Mary the mother of Jesus. Withdrew into the desert place. And resting under a palm tree. When she was. When she went into labor. Does that remind you of Hagar in the Old Testament in Genesis 21? Yes. The account is about Hagar, Sarah's handmaiden, who was driven out into the wilderness because of the jealousy of Sarah. But according to the Koran, Mary, the mother of Jesus withdrew in the desert place and rested under a palm tree and went into labor. If memory serves me correctly, I think she went into labor in Bethlehem and in a barn or a cave functioning as a barn. I could go on and on with discrepancies, contradictions, anachronisms, All day long in this. Now it was Muhammad who offers us to take the challenge to find contradictions. Did he not? Were it from any other than God, they would surely have found in it many contradictions. What have we done? Found many contradictions. Therefore, 
based upon Muhammad's challenge, we have proved him not to be a prophet. You have well spoken, Muhammad. It isn't from God, since we have found in it many contradictions. Now, let me add a couple of things in addition to this. You have probably wondered whether or not Muhammad taught that the martyr would uh, go into paradise and enjoy the presence of a harem with 72 maidens. Now, let's truly represent him. He did not say 72. That was a commentator after him calculating the number that would be made up of the harem promised by Muhammad. And that is found in chapter 55 and 56. Now, the sensual pleasure of this life promised to a martyr is the being maximized in paradise, which is heaven for them. And this carnality is really not a surprise considering the founder had 11 wives and claimed, it's claimed that he had one that was under 10 years of age. Yes, you heard that correctly. I, for one, cannot accept the Koran as the pure word of God, nor can I accept a man like Muhammad who but butchered uh, unarmed Jews, caravans, and promoted martyrdom by painting a picture of paradise that appeals to men and not to women, and what is one that is sensual and carnal. Now, Muhammad couldn't read or write, and his knowledge of the Bible was obviously handed down to him by those whose understanding must have been limited to. Now, if he was a prophet, he should have been able to correct the mistakes of his teachers, don't you feel? That's, that's fair. But, you know, I have just been thinking about this. Who knows? These Jews may have intentionally planted these contradictions in order that we may today be able to see those contradictions and thereby disprove the claims, disprove the claims of the Koran and ultimately disprove Muhammad. I thank you very much for listening to me. I'm going to make both lessons on Islam and the Koran available next week. I'll have handouts for you if you'd like to take them and uh, study them on your own time and, and leisure and uh, have a ready reference uh, any time that you're called upon to defend the word of God as being the word of God and expose the Koran for being a writing of men rather than a writing writings of God. Now, before I close, let me say that I can turn on any page of the Koran and read something good. Because I believe that many of the principles that he teaches in the Koran are based upon his learning of the writings of the Old Testament and the New Testament. So there are reflections and paraphrases of the writings of Jesus, the apostles of the Old Testament. And so obviously... There's going to be good things in this. Otherwise, it would have never, ever succeeded in being accepted as the word of God. So I am not going to discredit the whole book because I'd be discrediting, discrediting the quotation and references uh, to biblical principles as well. And I would caution you not to simply say that the Koran uh, seeks to um, eliminate all unbelievers, um, Jews and Christians, because that's not exactly correct. Um, the, the problem comes is when Islam is attacked by Jews or Christians, then they are encouraged to retaliate. But they are not taught to initiate violence where there is no violence received by Jews and Christians. And so that's a misrepresentation by 
uh, a lot of people uh, who haven't read the Quran at all. What I'm concerned is that it is that people believe in the Quran and are converted to Islam without knowing the facts. There's too many contradictions for it to claim to be the word of God. When you turn to the Bible, no contradictions. You turn to the Quran, contradictions. Harmony, disharmony. Which would you choose? What would you place your hope of eternity on? And by the way, any religion that represses women and puts them down and doesn't even mention what reward they'll have in paradise, but emphasizes the reward of men in paradise, and that's a carnal pleasure, uh, how can that truly be the word of God? Just think about that, and that alone should convince most people how erroneous such a claim is. We're going to offer them an invitation to you. If you're not a Christian, we would urge you to accept the purity of Jesus as the sacrifice for our sins and the only hope of eternal life. Won't you come as we stand and as we sing? God is calling the prodigal come without delay. Hero.